in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to kind of pick up and continue where we left off, and we went over to this blackboard. We talked about thoughts. I'm going to breeze through those because I got another blackboard that I want to get to tonight, but I want to make sure that, that, that this is in our mind when we're doing this. And we're talking about thoughts, or last week we talked about thoughts. Tonight we're going to talk about the mind. Now, we've already in lessons in the past, and by the way, if there's anybody watching, and this is the first time you're watching, you need to go back and see some of the lessons in the past to do with the mind. And well, to do with all of this, the image of God. But what I'm hoping, uh, trusting, trusting, amen, Jesus. I'm trusting that we are going to understand the relationship of the mind to the thoughts, and the thoughts are what we introduced last week. The minds and the thoughts, our minds and the thoughts, how they work together in order for us to go through transformation, which is the renewing of our mind, that we would renew our mind and then go through metamorpho, the caterpillar to the butterfly. So we're wanting to go through that. But also Romans tells us that God foreordained, that means before the earth was here, he, his intentions were that you and I be conformed to the image of his son. Now, we weren't even created yet, yet God's intention was that even though we were created in one way, it was his foreordained plan that we be conformed to the image of his son. Therefore, we were not created in the image of his son, we were created in the image of God, and then we're going to be conformed to the image of the Son. So I'm saying that to say this is the context of the journey and the things that we're talking about right now. Now what we have done on the journey is come to understand that when Jesus left, he did not leave us alone, but he said, I will send the Holy Spirit in my stead. He will teach you, lead you, guide you, show you things to come. He will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears that he will speak. So what Jesus was saying was to his disciples, look, you've walked with me and the things that you've accomplished, you've done through walking with me, but I'm going away. Now I am going to send you the promise of the father and he will be to you as I have been to you. So this is the, the context of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as I said, we tend to, when people say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or we're going to learn about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they tend to focus on the gifts of the Spirit or the manifestations of the Spirit for ministering to people and for doing the will of God. And those are great, they're wonderful, and they're true. But when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, he talked about another him, a him, alos, Greek word alos. He says, another one is coming like me. Alos means just like me, the same as me. So Jesus was talking about him coming and Jesus never mentioned what we call the nine gifts of the Spirit. Now, Jesus walked in them, but he didn't mention them in association with the Holy Spirit. Now, they definitely, truly are in the walk of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus stressed the Holy Spirit's ability to speak to us. That's what Jesus focused on was the Holy Spirit speaking to us, leading us, guiding us, opening our understanding, teaching us. Jesus said, I have things to say to you, but you can't, you can't grasp them. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he, he will be able to teach you because he's going to be in you. Now, all of the, the terms that Jesus used, the descriptive terms that Jesus used concerning the Holy Spirit, all of them were about communicating, communication, that he was going to communicate with us. So this is why I'm, I'm stressing 
this aspect of the walk of the Holy Spirit because in order for us to be conformed to the image of the Son, which is God's foreordained desire, in order for us to experience transformation, we must hear Him who Jesus said would speak to us in His stead. And yet so many Christians today do not believe that God still speaks because the general understanding is God gave us the Bible once it was canonized and put in print and everything, then God quit speaking because he's given us the Bible. And I'm saying that is absolutely not true. God did not quit speaking. He will never quit speaking. There's nothing in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation that there's ever going to be a time when God does not speak to his people. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So we, we, we've, got to, we've got to wake up to the reality, or as I would say, repent from not listening to the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, what we've discovered is, we do hear from Him, we've been hearing from Him, but because we had a preconceived idea what it would be like to hear from the Holy Spirit, we have not recognized how he speaks to us. So this is the focus of last week's lesson, this week's lesson, and probably the next uh, two or three weeks is recognizing how we work, how, how the walk of the Spirit works, how walking in the Spirit works, and hopefully to dislodge some wrong thinking which would stop us and cause us to say, and which most believers say today, if I said to someone, does, does God speak to you? Do you hear Jesus' voice? Because he said his sheep hear his voice. Do you hear his voice? And most people say, uh-uh, nah. I don't think I've ever heard. I don't think I've ever heard his voice. But what I'm wanting you to understand is you have, you just, it didn't fit in, in the way you thought it would be to hear the voice of the Lord. Now, I want to read three or four verses, maybe, no, not verses, three or four sections, and then I'm going to try to quickly, briefly run over the, the thought portion of the blackboard and then go over to our other blackboard and deal with what we're going to deal with tonight. So let me pull this slide up um, so that you can see these. Isaiah 55, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9, that'll be the next slide. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That implies he will respond if you call upon him. Let the wicked forsake his ways, so we, and a highlighted ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Now, we spent a lot of time last week on thoughts. Thoughts are an important question for us to hang on to in this. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Next slide. For my thoughts, now this, this is something we're going to really venture into right now, but my thoughts, God's thoughts, are not your thoughts. So I'm going to paraphrase a little addition to this. My thinking is not your thinking, and my ability to think is not like your ability to think. Now, this is going to make more sense when we get to the second blackboard. Now, listen, my thinking is not your thinking, and my ability to think is not like your ability to think. So now let's go back to the verse. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, if God is not planning on speaking to us, this would be a very discouraging section of verses, but he does plan to speak to us, so therefore, it's not discouraging to know that his thoughts are not my thoughts because his intention is that I know his thoughts. That's God's intention. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I'm just gonna introduce this and really not spend any more time on it than to introduce it to get you to think outside the box or get to think outside the whatever it is, the way you would think the Lord would speak to you. 
John 5, 19 and 20. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you that the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. What does he mean by that? What he sees the Father do. Was the heavens open to him every time he was going to do something? And he saw and the Father came down and demonstrated real quick what to do? What does he mean he sees the Father do? And for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, now listen, and shows him. What does he mean shows him? Shows him all the things that he himself does. What does he mean sees the Father do and the Father shows him? Next slide. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of my own authority, meaning what I spoke did not originate with me, but the Father who sent me gave me command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, now listen to this, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. What does he mean, just as the Father has told me? Next slide. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. That means the things which are above are findable. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Why is he telling us set our mind on things above? Now the word for set your mind, it's actually one Greek word, and it means to exercise the mind, to entertain or have a sentiment or opinion by implication to be mentally disposed on things above, more or less earnestly in a certain direction on things above, intensively to interest oneself with concern or obedience on things above. This is what Jesus was saying. Set your mind on things above. This is the last slide, and then I'm going to cover the two blackboards. Luke 8, 11. And by the way, I don't expect you to remember all this. Just that I'm setting our minds. I'm setting our minds in a direction. Luke 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this. This is the parable of the seed and the sower. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and then the devil, now listen to this, the devil comes and takes away the word of God out of their hearts. What? The devil has access to my heart to remove something? The devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Matthew 13, 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. These are the ones, and these are two different gospels of the same event. So, now, here's what I want to do. What I just introduced without going into the detail of those verses, which is a miracle that I was able to get through those that fast. <laughs> but what I wanted us to see is this. Apparently, Jesus learned some type of walk. We know that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He grew in the knowledge of Scripture. So what we see in Jesus' life was that he lived as a man. Now, I know he was God in the flesh, but he lived as a man and he lived as a man who was led by the Spirit of God. 
So when Jesus said, I only say what I hear the Father say, we have to, we have to say, okay, well, what, is this, well, what does this mean? What does, was, was Jesus audibly hearing and nobody else heard it? Was the, were the heavens open because apparently he saw what the Father did and then did it? He heard what the Father said and then said it. He said, I only say what I hear to say. I only do what I see him do. How did he see and hear this? This is what I want to know. Because if we read the testimony of those who were around Jesus, they were not aware, or at least the gospel writers did not write down, they were not aware like saying, oh, Yes, Jesus went down the street and all of a sudden the heavens were open and and God started showing him things and and all of a sudden voices started speaking and thunderings and things rumbled. Now, there were a few events. Actually, it was very rare that God spoke audibly where eardrums wiggled. It was very rare in the whole word of God that God spoke audibly. So how was God speaking to Jesus? Now, I'm I'm building off of that to say we are then told in the Word of God as born-again believers, set your mind on things above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind? Set your mind? So what I'm wanting to introduce, we talked about thoughts last week, and I'm going to briefly touch on a a few of those definitions because those are important to what we're going to see is what we're going to find out. And I'm going to briefly also go over the image of God, which is past lessons, but important that we understand that in light of what we're going to talk about the mind. But what, what we're going to discover is Jesus was having a continual conversational relationship with God but it was not always audibleized with his mouth. Now, there were times that he separated himself, and we can assume that he possibly prayed with his mouth and spoke out loud some things, but we also know he was hearing things that he said and doing things that he did because he saw them. He saw the Father do them, yet none of the apostles' writings say that they were aware of him seeing before he did and hearing before he spoke until after he apparently said to them these things were happening. But we don't, you would not conclude from their writings that they were aware like, oh, look, 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 Jesus is hearing from him right now. Look, 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 Jesus is, is seeing something right now. We don't have any indication that that was happening. So what I want to do, I want to now introduce what I'm calling thought speech. I want to go over to that board again real quick. Yes, I want to go over to this blackboard and just walk through this. Now, As I said, I asked the question, what is a thought, before last week, and we covered this in more detail, so I'm not going to spend the time on this, but I just want to bring us up to to snuff. I asked the question, what is a thought? And then I explained, a thought is a measure, means it has a beginning and an end. It's a measure of quantity, and it's a measure in quality meaning it can be from God, it can be from the evil one, it could be from your neighbor and be a mixture. Or (laughs) we're not getting into that now. But a thought is a measure of quantity and quality of information. A thought carries information. A thought is a vehicle to carry information. Now, as I said before, a thought is, is a divine ability. God has this ability because the Word of God says God has thoughts. We just read it. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So God has thoughts. So thinking is a divine ability. This divine ability processing thoughts, exchanging thoughts, it's a divine ability. 
It's because we have the image of God on the inside of us. So God has this ability, angels has, have this ability, and people have this ability due to the image of God. God gave this ability to exchange and receive thoughts because God wanted to communicate his thoughts and desires, which is him. God's thoughts and desires, he's always had. God doesn't come up with new thoughts. God is what he is. And so God is wanting to express and to communicate and to impart what he thinks. Why? Because what he thinks is who he is. So this is a divine design. Fourth, thought, and this is the primary one to hang on to for where we're headed. Thought is a supernatural communication it is the language of the Spirit. So when Jesus was approaching something and the Holy Spirit then opened to him, opened his vision, not only natural vision, opened and he saw, or opened and he heard. Now Jesus said the Holy Spirit was going to speak on behalf of the Father and speak on behalf of him. He would not speak of himself. He would speak what he was told. Well, if that's the case, then who was the Holy Spirit hearing from? He was hearing from the Father. And Jesus said, I said what I heard the Father say. How did he hear it? Because the Holy Spirit spoke to him in the language of the Spirit. Thought speech. Thought. Carriers of information from the heart of God to the heart of his Son. Now listen. I know Jesus was the word of God, but when he came down, he humbled himself, took the form of a man, which was even lower than the angels. It was humbling to him to operate this way, but he did it nonetheless because he was setting a precedent for us. And Jesus then went about doing good. And even when things were done and miracles were done, he said, I don't do these, but the Holy Spirit is doing these. So see, Jesus walked listening to the Spirit of God. The other thing is this. Words are not thoughts. Words are vehicles that transport thoughts. Words are not thoughts. Words are vehicles that transport thoughts. Then I'm going to skip through these over here so that we can get to the other blackboard. But I do want to say this, God's thoughts, which are carried in the vehicles of words, God's thoughts are vehicles themselves. And what they carry is truth. So what we find out is that God is imparting truth, but he is truth. So God is imparting from himself his thinking, his ways. So now we say, oh, this is great. This is the language of the Spirit. So therefore, as I read about Samuel, Samuel heard from God when he was just a boy. They, they, tradition says 12 years old. God spoke to him and said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel thought it was Eli. Three times God spoke to him and he thought it was Eli. The third time he said to Eli, you know, you're calling me. He said, I'm not calling you. And then Eli, thought speech, God spoke in the heart of Eli and Eli realized this boy is hearing from God. But because he's hearing from God, it's not a given that you'll know it. Therefore, I'm going to have to teach him how the voice of God comes to him. So then he said to Samuel, the boy, he said, Samuel, Ah, you're hearing from God and don't recognize it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back and the next time you hear him call, then I want you to say, here I am, Lord, speak. And when he responded appropriately to God, that was the beginning of an <laughs> extraordinary life. And God began to speak to him incredible things. Now, I'm saying that to say to us, we're going to go over and, and look at this other board. I'm saying that all of this is to come together, not so that you memorize all these verses or know everything that I'm communicating to you, other than to say this. 
Wake up to your thought life. God is speaking to you by His Spirit. And you need to respond appropriately and say to Him, Here I am, Lord, speak. And I personally would recommend that you repent. Not in the sense of that you were trying to be mean, but that you repent and say, Father, forgive me for not setting my mind on things above. And when you spoke, I didn't respond. I didn't even listen. Most of the time I ignored them or cast them down as crazy thoughts because I would hear things that were so beyond me. So that's what I would recommend. Now, what we're going to do now is thoughts are only valuable. Thoughts are only good if you have a capacity to receive them. Thoughts are everywhere. God's thinking is everywhere. God's everywhere. But you have to be able to receive God's thoughts. How do we do this? So now I want us to go to this other blackboard. So here we go. We're coming over to this blackboard. And I know they look busy, but this is the way that it kind of develops in my mind when I'm writing it out. So I'm going to start right here and, and try to do this quickly so that we can get through this blackboard. But if you remember when I taught about heart, soul, mind, and strength, we found out God has a heart, God has a soul, God has a mind, and God has strength, and God is spirit. We found that out. Well, we also found out we're created in the image of God because Jesus said the greatest command, which had already said it in the word of God, but Jesus himself repeated it and said the greatest command is that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, I drew this because God is spirit and he has these capacities and he has more. But these are things that he clearly shows us in the word of God that he has. And we've already studied that. But I want you to know you have these things because this is the commandment that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I drew them separately because they're mentioned separately and they have different functions like your right eye is not your left eye. Yet, they're inseparable in your vision. When you're looking out, you don't say, say like if you look across the street and you see a tree, you don't say, I'm looking at that tree with my right eye unless you're covering your left eye. You, you just, you're seeing, but you do have a right eye that's not your left eye and you have a left eye that's not your right eye. And the same with hearing, provided that your hearing works properly, you hear at the same time in both ears and that then comes together as your hearing. I'm saying that to say this, though the heart and the mind are separate like your right eye, left eye, they're actually inseparable because we're going to find out your mind does a process called thinking, but your heart does a process called thinking, and your soul does a process called thinking. Well, does your soul have a separate mind, and your heart have a separate mind, and your mind have a separate mind from each other? No. What it, this is saying is you are a spirit, like God is a spirit, but you have these capacities, and for the sake of understanding that the right eye has a different function than the left eye, we say my right eye, my left eye. But we don't say it to say that they are two entirely separate operations. They are not. They're inseparable in your vision. And so the same with this, heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's what your spirit is. Your spirit is heart. It's soul. It's mind. It's strength. These are divine attributes. When God breathed life into us, he breathed the image of God in, into us. So now when I'm talking about the mind, a lot of people start saying, oh, this is psychology. We're not into psychology and that kind of stuff. We're into the spirit. Well, listen, God is a spirit and the word of God says he has a mind. So if God is a spirit and he has a mind, then the mind is part of the spirit. And it is part of the spirit. And this is where we've missed it. I, I, where I went to Bible school, God bless the teacher. I loved him and I still love him. He's with the Lord now. And so I'm sure the Lord's helped him broaden his understanding. But he used to say, you don't hear God with your mind. You hear him with your spirit. So I was in a dilemma. I was like, 
I'm trying to hear God with my spirit. How do you do it? Because everything was going into my mind. And I was trying to like pull my mind out and hear God in the spirit. I was straining. I did everything I could do to hear God in the spirit. But that was a false statement. You hear God, when you hear God, your mind is part of that hearing. And so your mind is a necessary part. And therefore, many of us have failed and are failing to walk in the things of the Spirit because we, we see our mind as an enemy. Our mind is not our enemy. Thinking, we're going to find out thinking is a supernatural, divine, I, I, it is so phenomenal to be able to think on the level of God. I don't mean that we think exactly like he does, but that he says, let me let you think in my world. That is like the omniscient, all-knowing God. I can know what he thinks because of the mind he gave me. Not because of smart, like we measure smart. No, the mind is a supernatural design to hear from God. Because what did we say about the thoughts over here? That God wants to impart his thoughts into us. And so our mind, they're incredible, our minds. Now, that's all of it's incredible. Our heart, our soul, and our strength, this is all incredible. But I'm saying... For, for the sake of this, because the Bible speaks so much about thoughts, which have to do with mind, and so much about our thinking, our thoughts, our minds. This is why when I read that verse, it says, set your mind in a direction. Why? When you set your mind in a direction, you strike up a conversation. When you set your mind on something, you start conversing. And as I've said so many times, you never think alone. Now, we're only going to talk about the God side of stuff. In a future lesson, when we talk about taking thoughts captive and we realize the enemy also has say so into our thinking. But I'm telling you, when you set your mind in a direction, you're sending out signals. You're saying, this is what I'm thinking on, and then you start getting responses. This is why the Word of God says, set your mind on things above, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? When you set your mind in that direction, you start getting feedback. You start hearing. You start receiving. And most of us, because this is so foreign to us, because we've seen our bodies as bad things, our minds as bad things, and we say, oh, I can't wait to go to heaven, get rid of all this and all this. No, no, this is divine design. Our minds are, oh, they're so incredible. It's just amazing. But so this is what we're going to talk about. So first of all, I've got them numbered. And then we're going to try to get through this in, in a timely manner. Our minds, now listen, our minds are designed to receive the thoughts of God. This is why we have the minds we have. They are designed to receive the thoughts of God. Number two, our minds... Remember, thoughts are carriers of information. And God's thoughts are carriers of truth. So we are designed to receive truth. We weren't created full of truth. We were designed to receive truth. Number two, our minds are designed to conceive the thoughts of God. Not just hear them but to actually conceive as in a woman. And we're going to come to that at the end part. Our minds are designed to conceive thoughts of God. When they come, remember what we read about Jesus? That We just read the short little section of one aspect. He says, the word of God is a seed. Think of a male. Think of a seed. The Word of God is a seed. Our minds are designed to conceive 
the thoughts of God, the truth of God. That's why you have a mind. You don't have a mind so you can get a job and work somewhere. And you don't have a mind so you can make a good living. You have a mind so that you can receive the truth of God from Him. From Him. I'm talking direct from Him. That He imparts the mind of God into us. Number three, our minds are designed, listen, to give birth. So I want us to receive, conceive, our minds are designed to give birth to the thoughts of God through thinking. God, listen, look at the whole story. We were created in the image of God. We fell into sin. Did God not know that was going to happen? He knew that was going to happen. As I told you at the beginning, he foreordained that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That means we weren't created in the image of his son. We were created in the image of the first Adam. But then also God breathed the image of God on the inside of us. God ordained us to be on a journey of change. Even Adam and Eve, had they not sinned, God intended to impart his thoughts into them and that it would give birth through those thoughts that would give birth to the will of God, the thoughts of God, and that would be that Adam and Eve would have been conformed to the image of the Son. But sin got in the way. God didn't change his plan. But I want you to notice that these, now listen, and we're going to go through the scriptural references for these, Romans 12 and so on, about renewing our minds, and we've been born again by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. Notice that God plants His words in us. What are words? They're carriers of the thoughts of God. God's, we're born again because God gave us thoughts that were from Him. How did we receive such thinking as this? because we were designed with these minds. So our minds are designed to give birth. This is, the, oh, oh, I could go so many directions. Give birth to the thoughts. God puts these thoughts in there, not just so that we can accumulate information. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. God implied there in Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, but you need my thoughts. Why? So that I can have a reservoir of God thinking so that I can answer questions when people present a question? No, because my thoughts are living. I told you my words are living. What are words? Carriers of thought. My words are living. They're alive. They're alive. I can actually impart myself into you through the carrier of words into your thoughts. And if you'll receive them and think on them, you'll give birth ultimately to the image of the Son. So now I want us to go to the fourth thing, thinking. We, now listen, this is a kind of a play on words, but we think we think like God. We think we think like God, but we don't think like God. We just read that in Isaiah. We think we do but we don't think like God. Here's one of the primary reasons to point out that we don't think like God. God, He, and I'm using a He on purpose, He is the origin and author of His thoughts. Listen, I know you think, you think like God, but God is the origin and author of his thoughts. You and I are not. I know you think you are. I know you think on the things that you really have come to understand even naturally that you think you're a genius, but you're not. Our minds are designed to receive. God has been giving us things and we never knew it was him. We thought it was us. We thought we were geniuses not knowing God is the one that gave us these great discoveries that have helped mankind and these things. You think you thought that up? You didn't think that up. Now you have an incredible mind, but this is one of the places your mind separates from God's. God has. He is, he is the origin and author of all of his thoughts. You and I are ones who receive thoughts and then they grow and become. Now, remember, we're not going to talk about the evil one right now, but he's capable too. So number four, 
thinking. We think we think like God. We don't. God is the author of his thoughts. You and I are recipients of thoughts, and then we move on those. Take heed what you see. Take heed what you hear. Take every thought captive. Make it obedient to Christ. Why? Because you're not the originator of all the thoughts that are flashing through your mind. Your mind is a supernatural capability of hearing things said in the spirit. And the devil knows this. And God knows this. We were designed to do this because God wanted to impart to us. He said, I made you like open, open wells so that I could pour into you. But you're allowing another. You're allowing another. Because see, we think, we think like God. God said, no one has ever put into my mind things from the outside and turned me in a direction. No. My thoughts are my own. Yours are not your own. The thoughts you have of God are not your own. They're his. The thoughts you have that you shouldn't be thinking own, they're not yours. They're from the evil one. We have no reason to believe from the word of God, what's written in the word of God, that had Satan not brought thoughts against God and brought them to Adam and Eve, we have no reason to believe that they would have sinned. That came from the outside. But because they didn't know, because they did not understand how dangerous it is to have such an incredible mind, yet not have judgment, on the thoughts that you're processing. And there we go. So number five, we don't think like God. We think human beings, we are incredible though. I'm telling you, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. We think in the image of God. That's how we think. We have the image of God and we think, and it's incredible. But we don't think as God thinks. God thinks without being influenced. You do not think without being influenced. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for the Word of God. What a tremendous influence into my thinking. God does not need influence from external sources for His thinking. We don't think like God thinks. See, I always read that before that my thoughts are not your thoughts. I thought, yeah, I need to learn the word of God so my thoughts are like his thoughts. He's like, if you knew the whole Bible, your thoughts are not like my thoughts because my thoughts are all my own from within me. Your thoughts are not. Your thoughts are what is generated from you receiving from the outside. And it's a divine design. It's a good thing, provided we're listening to God. But your thoughts are grown into what you become. God's thoughts are not grown into what he becomes. God is. So we don't think like God thinks. This is what he wants us to know. So we think in the image of God, but not as God. I wonder if this is why, I wonder if this is why, because we're different than God. We're created in his image and likeness, but we're different. I wonder if this is why he, I put the big he there, he, male, likens us to a bride. What do I mean, likens us to a bride? What woman produces her own seed? No woman produces her own seed. Even Mary, who it was a miraculous conception, she didn't produce her own seed. We can't produce our own godly thinking. This is why he calls him a he and likens us to a bride because he says, I have to impart into you to grow in you what I want you to be. I couldn't even create you like I wanted you to be because I have to impart into you and you play a part in this in order for me to have in you what I want. See, so a bride is someone who receives. So here's what I want to, I want to introduce this and then we'll get there provided, amen, we got time. Okay, we're going to have to fly. 
Number six. Now, this is a figure of speech, but I think it holds up biblically. Your mind is the womb, like Mary had a miracle in her womb. Your mind is the womb of the Spirit. Listen, thinking on God can birth such change in your life. Thinking about God, wondering about Him, thinking and, and, and chewing on. It's called meditation. And this is something where we're going to get into meditation. We're going to get into understanding and wisdom and to understand what these, but all of these, all of those, to, to tell you the truth, your mind is the womb of your spirit. The gestation, which is the time period between a woman, her conception, and then when she conceives and then has the baby. That's called the gestation period. You're thinking, when you're thinking, you're never thinking alone, number one. When you're thinking and you're thinking God's thoughts, I'm telling you something's growing. The life of God is growing. Your transformation is growing. The image of God, the image of His Son is growing. God, those whom He foreknew, He predestined that they would be conformed to the image of His Son. How could this be? How can we be like Jesus? Well, you can't in the twinkling of an eye, which is what most people are hoping for. When the Lord comes, I'll be changed the twinkle of an eye. I'll be just like Jesus. No, because the change... Now listen, we would shed our bodies and get new ones, but the change God wants us to go through, there's a lot of people that had just barely made it into heaven, and I got news for you. You know what they're doing? They're going through transformation and change. God is teaching them. He's imparting His thoughts into them. Why? Because the thief on the cross, did he make it? Yes, he made it. But was he conformed to the image of the Son? No, he was not. Why? Because it takes the thinking of God on the inside of us. It takes this gestation period. So listen, gestation is thinking, or I put under there meditation. Gestation is thinking your way to obedience. Because we're going to find out our bodies have everything to do with this. Gestation, the Word of God inside of us, gestation is thinking your way to obedience. That means action from the heart. That's another lesson. Which will birth the image of the Son in us. Folks, now I used to laugh at people uh, when I heard the people from the older generation, the Pentecostal people, and they used to call the TV the one-eyed devil. And I thought, oh, golly, what extremist. Huh, what? But I could honestly say today, that's not real far from the truth. And, and the reason being is this. We have become addicted. Thank you, Jesus. God delivered me from that. But <laughs> I got other issues. Okay. But we have become addicted to allowing our minds to be bombarded from the father of all lies. He lies about the future of the world. He lies about the future of God's people. He lies about Israel. He lies about God. He lies about the Son of God. He lies about the Word of God. All of this, this is what all of our programming is. And we sit and say, here's my mind. Plant your seeds in me. And yet the Word of God tells us, set your mind on things above. Because whatever you set your mind on, you draw the attention of the spirit world and you start hearing thoughts. Folks, listen to me. I said this one time and I didn't even understand what I understand now. The most dangerous thing in the world is an unrestrained thought. Because if a human being gets a hold of a thought and that thought gets a hold of him, what did Hitler do when the thought came into his mind, I can rule the world? Was that just a harmless thought? No, that was not a harmless thought. But likewise, when Jesus came, he took 12 apostles, 12 
disciples, and there was others, amen, thank you, Jesus, but he took the 12 and said, I can take the 12, and with the changing of their thinking and them meditating upon the word of God day and night, See, when God said to Joshua, meditate upon my word day and night that you may make your way prosperous. Why was he saying meditate? When you meditate, you set your attention. When you set your attention, you engage the author of that of which you're thinking about. When you set your mind on the things of God, the apostles learned from Jesus and they set their mind on the things that he said. And what did those 12 do? The whole world has been impacted by 12 people who were impacted by one. But it was really through the work of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance. That's a whole nother lesson there. So what I want you to understand is this. Your mind, our thoughts, and our minds are incredibly important things. So now we have to make a decision do I need to change <laughs> what I'm allowing my mind to be set on? Do I need to change the way I'm thinking? Amen. We're going to stop there. So here's what I, I just want to conclude with this. We have been lulled to sleep and we've been, our direction has changed. And I actually heard a minister say this about television. And uh, Susan sent me the link and, and I watched it. And he said to his church, he was saying, you worship your TV. And they, people responded, and I know how people respond. And, and well, I don't worship my TV. And he said, sure you do. Look at your house. All of your furniture is facing towards the television because that is your primary focus and attention. And when I heard that, I thought of when God said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I'm going to show you a greater abomination. He had showed him some abominations the people were doing. And he took him into the temple. God took Ezekiel into the temple and he said, look, look at those guys. And they were bowing to idols. And so Ezekiel said, oh, this is awful. They're bowing to idols. And God said, no, 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 no. That's not the point. Look at what direction they've turned. They've turned their faces that way. My ark is that way. They've turned their backsides to me. God cares what we set our attention on. And so now listen, I'm not saying this in a bad way. I'm saying it, in, oh, it's not a bad way. That's a, that's a good thing we need to know. We need to set our attention upon him and listen, He's here right now. Wherever you are, he's here. His face is right here. His face means his attention. And this is what I'm telling you. When you set your attention in a direction, you get replies. You get engagement from the author of what you're thinking about. So set your mind on the things of God. Set your mind on the word of God. Set your mind. Think about them. To chew on them. When you do, I don't know how it works in the sense of like electronically or whatever. I am telling you, when you do, you draw the attention of God. God says he's thinking about me. He's thinking. He's trying to understand that. Holy Spirit, open this to him. And it all, it's like, oh, 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 thank you, Lord. I see it. He says, keep your attention on me. I'll show you more. This is what Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do. But folks, we don't guard our minds. We, we give God service part of the week. I'm telling you, we need to think. We need to think. Listen, I know we have to function. You got to get gas in your car. You got to work a job. You got to take care of customers. I understand that. I'm not. But, but you, can, you can still be, Lord, I'm, I'm, I want to keep my mind on you, on, on the things of God, the word of God. And these thoughts begin to accumulate and they build inside of us. We're going to learn that in another lesson. Okay, let me just stop.